talk about the big picture of church growth. And tonight, this is really designed more as a coaching opportunity, and we've moved the podium away, and I'm not, I'm not planning to read from a prepared text. You have a handout in front of you. It's just one page, uh, double-sided, and I, I'm using that. You have the information there that I'm going to show, and I'm using that to introduce you uh, to six categories or kinds of churches today in North America. And I do this for two reasons. One is that I have found church leaders find it very helpful to open their imagination to realize there's more to the diversity and vibrancy and opportunity of the church than you have yet seen in your particular congregation and context. So often we think, well, this is it. This is all there is. There, there really isn't anything more. Well, there's a lot more. And, and we are living at a time of incredible ferment and innovation in how to do church in North America. And, and now is the time to learn from that. So as we walk through this, I suspect many of you will be kind of placing yourself and say, ah, you know, that's where I am or that's where my church is. And, and, and you have a sense of where you are in the spectrum of uh, Christian movement in North America. And, and as all typologies, I'm sure that you'll see a little bit of yourselves here and a little bit of yourselves there. Uh, it's, not, it's not all the time that everyone is perfectly in one of these types. But, but you will begin to kind of see where you are in the spectrum of the Christian movement. Now, the other reason I share with, uh, this with you is that this allows us to begin to talk much more uh, practically, uh, pragmatically, programmatically, tactically, to help you understand fundamental strategic moves that you can initiate in your situation that can take you further to the next step in the Christian movement. And, and so that, I hope, will open up further dialogue. And my plan is to, to share with you uh, some and then deliberately pause and invite you to ask questions and we'll dialogue a little bit. And then I'll carry on and we'll dialogue a little bit. And we'll walk through the six kind of types of churches. And then I hope that we have time left to prime the pump for our conversation about spiritual leadership tomorrow and we'll turn that page over that you have and we'll begin to talk about not, how, not just how you reinvent the church, but how you reinvent yourself, how, how you begin to transform yourself as a, as a church leader, whether you're a clergy person or a lay person, and, and that will begin to help us talk more about the stresses and strains and, and, and learning curves that are before all of us as we grow God's mission. So that's, that's my plan, uh, and uh, let's go ahead and begin. There, there are, in a sense, there are basically three broad kinds of church in North America, and within each of those kinds there are two categories. So you might say there are six types of church. So the three kinds of church that are out there, there are heritage churches, there are culturally normative churches, and there are laser-targeted churches. And if you kind of follow along as I'm talking on the chart, you, you will begin to see that, that heritage churches tend to talk about church renewal. Uh, um, culturally normative churches tend to talk about growing faith communities, and laser-targeted churches, as I call them, really talk about missional movements. Or, if you want to keep it simple, in the box, out of the box, beyond the box. About 80% of the churches in North America are in the box. They are heritage churches. They are denominational churches. They look back to a specific tradition, a specific time of origin, often in the 19th, 18th, maybe back to the 17th, 16th centuries. Uh, they are uh, loyal to denominations and to certain polities and practices and traditions. And, and they, they generally are looking to recover or restore or renew 
the original vitality of their church as it once was, either denominationally a century ago or, or locally uh, a decade ago or whatever. But, but in a sense, they are in the box. And there are two kinds. There are chaplaincy churches and there are family churches. So let's talk about uh, these different kinds of churches. Uh, at the very bottom, kind of in the middle of the column, you'll notice that in-the-box churches uh, will always resist change. Uh, they practice rigid accountability in the shape of redundant oversight and supervision. So these tend to be high bureaucracy churches. They tend to be preoccupied with what I would call good theology, politically correct theology, sound historical doctrine, these kinds of churches. Um, chaplaincy churches are one of the most common churches today. They are not always small, but they often are small, often less than 100 people. Uh, chaplaincy churches tend to talk about maintenance, uh, not just of the tradition, but of the property, of the location, of the organizational model. They are heavily invested into caregiving, uh, visitation, uh, taking care of the emotional, physical, relational needs of aging members through the various life cycles until they die. Uh, they are particularly tempted to be sidetracked into membership privilege. Uh, they tend to argue a lot about seemingly trivial things, like what kind of coffee we should serve after, after the worship service, or, or, or like, you know, should, should we have, have live flowers or artificial flowers on the communion table, or... Uh, they tend to argue a lot about uh, um, whether you can be in my pew or, or whether someone else can sit in my pew or, or that kind of thing. They, they are uh, very protective of their membership privileges, uh, although it would also be said that they love each other very, very much. Uh, there's an intense affection often within the, the congregation, and in some ways they can sometimes resemble a 12-step group. Of, of people who are kind of, uh, you know, hurting, each, hurting people, helping each other through common difficulties and problems. Uh, they are very often very loyal to the denomination, and indeed the denomination is often uh, subsidizing these congregations financially. Uh, they uh, are given to information, informational kind of worship. In a, in a chaplaincy kind of church, the announcements in the worship service are often as long as the sermon. Uh, they, they, are, they, are, they all need to know everything that's going on. You know, and if some meeting is happening in the church building, they'll phone up the pastor, well, who's at the building? You know, I need to know. Why do you need to know? I, I just need to know. Um, chaplaincy churches really, really want to know if the, uh, you know, if the, if the choir leader or the organist or the, or the singer has children and what their names are. Why do you need to know that? Well, I don't, you know, I just need to know. Chaplaincy churches uh, believe in disseminating a lot of information and, and probably the, the, the thing that, that leads them to be unfaithful, you might say, to the gospel is that they protect harmony at all costs it is very difficult to confront anyone in a chaplaincy church because you might hurt their feelings or, they, or their uncle might have their feelings hurt or their brother-in-law or their sister-in-law. Uh, and, and so they'll often tell you just, you know, quiet down, calm down, uh, just, just nurse your wounds, don't speak about it. We don't want to hurt any feelings. We don't want to ruffle any feathers. We want to be one big happy family. And, and so, you will find it often is very difficult, although the chaplaincy church will talk about how inclusive and open and welcoming they want to be, and from their position inside the chaplaincy church, 
there's a tremendous amount of love and acceptance and harmony, it is often very difficult for the newcomer to break in to that, to that harmonious circle because they're just that much different. Uh, these chaplaincy churches obviously tend to uh, age uh, and they, they have certain desires. They, when they talk to me as a consultant, they, they want to renew their vitality, but mainly they want to survive. They, they want to be able to meet that budget. They want to be able to pay their bills, uh, you know, keep the heat on in the building, uh, and they don't want to stray very far from their comfort zones. So it's always very difficult to consult with a chaplaincy church because they want to change without changing. You, you've been there. You know some of those churches. They want, to, they want to grow without growing. You know, they want more people, but they don't want many people because then we won't know everybody by their first name. And they will not stray very far from their comfort zones. They, they tend to be churches... Uh, that are filled with people very loyal to the denomination and they tend to have olders and children but not anybody in the middle. So the grandparents bring the grandchildren and the parents take the morning off. And, and they're, very, they're very keen on children's ministry. So when you talk to them as a consultant, what they often will want to do is, is say, how can we get a better Sunday school curriculum? How can we reach out to those children? Um, uh, and uh, how can we restore our Sunday school or have a better nursery? And the first staff position, if they had the money, the, the first staff position they would like to hire would be a children's minister. So just to give an example, tell an anecdote of kind of what I mean, I was in uh, Peterborough, Ontario a number of years ago uh, to a chaplaincy church. Now, this chaplaincy church was, in fact, a very large property, and the congregation had about 500 members on the books, although they only worshipped about 75 on a given morning. You see what's happening. 425 people didn't find it important to worship on a Sunday morning in a chaplaincy church because that's not what binds them together. It, it's their relationships with each other. It's their friendships with each other and so on. Anyway, I came there. They're right downtown in Peterborough. And they said to me, we love children. We have a core value for children. We want children in the church. The only problem was they didn't have any. That was the reason for the consultation. They, and they said, there are apartment buildings all around us, and there are children everywhere, and they don't come to church. Okay, we begin the consultation. First story they tell me is how they spent money to build a brand new state-of-the-art nursery for the children that they loved. And they laid down brand new carpeting in the nursery. And a week after they had laid down the brand new carpeting, all the Play-Doh went missing from the nursery. Thieves have broken in, they said. They've stolen all the Play-Doh and left all the computers. Until the trustees confessed. They said, no, 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 no. Thieves did not break in. We're very secure here. We took it. Because Play-Doh hardens in the carpeting. And we just laid down new carpeting. So now the consultation was over, you see, because we now had decided that they did not have a core value for children. They had a core value for carpeting. At chaplaincy Church. And what was interesting, you see, is even after we discovered that, they still wouldn't put the Play-Doh back in the nursery, you see. These are, these are churches that usually just have one preacher, one pastor, and they want that pastor to be a great one-to-one -one counselor. They want that pastor to visit, 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 constantly everywhere, nursing homes, uh, new homes, old members. They want that pastor to be always available 24-7, no matter what, phones always ringing off the hook. They want that pastor usually to live next door to the church building, and that person must be ordained and certified by the denomination. Now, that's the kind of chaplaincy church that's out there, and if, and if you want to break them out, if you want to take them out to the next step, 
here are the three key strategic moves. Number one, these churches desperately need to renew their clergy. These clergy are half dead. They, they are absolutely exhausted and burned out. And chaplaincy churches tend to rotate their clergy every three to four years simply because they burn them out. And then they get someone else in, they burn that one out, and so on and so on and so on. More clergy go on disability out of chaplaincy churches than any other kind of church. And somehow or other, whether it's to take them away on retreat or to pay for them to take a vacation to Honolulu or, or whatever you need to do, those clergy need to recover a life, to recover vitality, sometimes simply to recover their health. Second thing you need to do is you need to enliven their worship. Uh, worship in a chaplaincy church is usually incredibly boring. Uh, there's a lot of uh, solemn silence. There's a lot of needless ceremony. You know, 40 people in worship, and when they serve as communion, they have all kinds of processionals and recessionals and people standing up and sitting down and serving the, you know. There's a great deal of, of slow hymnology. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of alto and soprano music with very few tenors and basses and not much rhythm. You need to enliven that worship service. If you can enliven that worship service, then indeed you might be able to attract more families, more children, and so on. Now, of course, um, both of these strategic moves, the, 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 the reviving of the clergy and the enlivening of worship, will both be very controversial and stressful for the people within the chaplaincy church. They don't see the need for it, perhaps, but neither do they want to break out of their comfort zones. Chaplaincy churches like things predictable. They want to know what is going to happen in worship next week to the letter. And that's why the clergy often just have a computer program in which the worship service is designed. They just kind of drop in you know, certain alternative prayers and hymns and so on. They only sing about 10 or 15 different hymns, in a given year, it's the 10 and 15 favorite hymns of the matriarchs and patriarchs, largely ignoring the rest of the hymnal. Uh, and, and, you know, they'll just have the, the liturgy and they'll, they'll drop in a prayer of confession to pray for things that they didn't know they'd done and be reassured in three or four alternative formulas. And, and they love their predictability in worship so much that that's why they don't have to come. Remember I said that only a fraction of the members feel the need to come to worship because they already know what's going to happen. So the, the, they use the lectionary, it's in three-year cycles, they could read up. The, the sermon is printed out, the pastor will email it or hand it out to people, you don't have to be there. You know the, you know the formula, you know the hymns, you, know, you really don't need to be there, and if you're fortunate to be in a women's group or a men's group or some kind of fellowship club, then you're going to still meet your friends, I don't have to go. And it's very common in a chaplaincy church that, that someone will tell you, oh, you know, Reverend Bandy, I can't come to worship because of my arthritis. And I, you know, I can't get out. Oh, that's very, I, I'm so sorry, Mildred. And then after worship, I'm in the shopping mall, there's Mildred. <laughs> Mildred, I thought you had arthritis. Well, it only affects me Sunday mornings. Now, probably the most difficult thing that you have to do in a chaplaincy church, and, and we'll talk about this several times this evening, and already I've mentioned it, is, is that you have to break control. Uh, fundamentally, in a chaplaincy church, the core values, bedrock beliefs, motivating vision, and key mission of this church is dictated by the personal aesthetic tastes, political preferences, and ideological points of view of one or two matriarchal or patriarchal families. And to try to break that control 
will be one of the hardest and most controversial things you can do. Because as, a, as soon as you try to confront that, the stress level goes up, and now they're going to protect harmony at all costs. But unless you break that control, unless you make that confrontation, you will never be able to pry God's mission loose from the fingers of people that fundamentally want to shape the mission around their personal needs. This is a problem, which we'll, we'll see still in the next category of church. This is a problem uh, because um, these congregations rely on high homogeneity. Uh, these congregations uh, are churches where, in which the members kind of all look the same. They do not reflect or mirror the demographic diversity of the neighborhood or of the community. And, and in fact, the ushers practice a kind of unofficial and often uh, unintentional but very, in, very clear uh, filtering process as, as newcomers drop into the church. And they will kind of do an, a mental sort and they will encourage people that look like us to come on into the inner circle of the church but those people that don't look like us, they will manage to kind of, in, in various ways, kind of move them to the edge and the margin, kind of kick them out the door and close it again. It, it, there's kind of this filtering process of homogeneity. Um, you will find tomorrow, uh, I'll be talking more about the seven stages of control. Uh, meet with me at 3.30 in either the boardroom or Langley room in, uh, in the Divinity College at 3.30, and we're going to talk in depth about control issues. And there are seven stages, and here are two of them. Uh, usually, it, it is in the chaplaincy church where they are most in denial and they're most inflexible. Uh, they're in denial about the realities of their changing postal code. They're in denial about the real spiritual, physical, mental, emotional, relational needs of people in their community. Uh, and they are extraordinarily inflexible to get out of their comfort zones uh, because of this high homogeneity. Now, let me carry on and introduce you to the family church, which is one step beyond the chaplaincy church, uh, and then I'm going to stop and we'll, we'll see what questions you have and probe a little bit deeper. If, if you are able to enliven the clergy, and if you are able to enliven the worship, and if you are able to pry loose or at least persuade controlling families to let go of, of the church so it can become more than they want it to be, if you can do those things, the church will begin to grow. Younger families, younger people, even children will begin to come. They will be attracted by the livelier worship. They will be attracted by a pastor who, who is alive inside and able to relate to them personally. They will be attracted to the, to the greater innovation and experimentation of the church. And, and that church will become much more family church, family in the sense that it attracts families. Families begin to come as a body, as a unit. Now, to be sure, it's usually traditional kinds of families. Husband, wife, two children, three children, kind of traditional families. And, and that's difficult because we live in a world of, of more and more non-traditional families. But these are more traditional families. They will come to church. It's also the family church in the sense that this is a church that uses the metaphor of church family to describe themselves. So whenever you hear them speak of their church, they talk about, well, well, we're a church family. We love one another. And all that you read often in, uh, in, in denominational training or in, or in divinity colleges or whatever, all that you've read about family systems theory applies in this church because the church really runs itself as if they were an extended family, which is why the family church will usually not grow beyond 200 members. If it grows beyond 200 members, it will, it, will, it will peak and then regress and lose some people so they can come back to 200 members. 
because family systems theory works well when you just have 200 members. You cannot know more than 200 people by their first name. So you don't want to grow above it. And there are many large churches uh, in the 1940s that actually regressed and shrunk back to the family church size of 200 people simply because we're a family church. It's the major metaphor of their life. Now, they too want to renew themselves. I'll kind of put all this up there so we can talk about it. Uh, they are very merciful. They tend to nurture and reward people who are strong in the spiritual gift of mercy. In fact, that's the most important spiritual gift of all. You don't have to have a gift of evangelism, a gift of administration, a gift of teaching, provided you're merciful. They are very nice people. Very merciful people. And they expect their pastor to be a merciful person. They are strong in visitation, uh, and they want the pastor to visit and visit and visit. Uh, they are also big on consensus management. Uh, they, they want to be in, everybody wants to be in on even the smallest decisions about property, about renovation, about worship, about whatever. In the family church, the annual meeting often lasts about three to four hours. As they walk painfully, line by line, through the budget, read carefully and approve every report, and, and kind of examine and, and nominate and elect every officer, in a family-sized church, in a family-structured church, in a church with a metaphor that we're a family, uh, about 60% of the members service the infrastructure. The rule of thumb is that the bigger the family church, the bigger the board. Everybody's in a committee. If you want to know what's going on, join a committee. If a newcomer comes to the church, the first thing you do is try to get them in a committee. If committee or bureaucracy is the way they assimilate members. In a family church, uh, they also are very strong on their heritage, but it's usually their local heritage and less their denominational heritage. And so they're very big on how we do it here in this community, and we don't have a lot to learn from the way they do it there in that community because we're just different. We're a family. We're unique. Uh, they also have their control issues, which I'll talk about more in a moment, uh, because consensus management in itself is a way of controlling innovation and creativity. They know that if anybody's too wacky or strange or innovative, we can slow them down and eventually close them down by just going through all the hoops of redundant bureaucracy and, and management. Um, in family churches, they will begin to diversify worship. So you may see in a family church a second worship service, but they will diversify worship according to time, that is to say the 9 o'clock service and the 11 o'clock service, but it's the same service, or they will diversify worship according to style. And so there we begin to see intruding the language of traditional worship, contemporary worship. But in a family church, if, if, if an outsider really looks at it, or as a consultant, if I go to that church, they talk about a contemporary service and a traditional service. I don't see any difference. You know, the contemporary service has one or two songs that are a bit more bouncy. But otherwise, it's the same biblical text, it's the same sermon, it's the same songs. You know, maybe they're not in gowns, maybe just in a suit and tie, but it's really basically the same. They haven't diversified it very much. Uh, they, they want to have change without transformation. And by that I mean they want the church to change and grow, but the people and the leaders are unwilling to pay the personal price in personal transformation. I want the church to change, but I am unwilling to submit to the kind of faith formation spiritual discipline and personal growth that will allow the church to really change and grow. 
I don't want to change. You change. First question, or the first thing they will say to me, if, if I'm a consultant in a family church and I come in, they will tell me, they'll, they'll say, Tom, what do those people need to do to grow the church? It's not, what do I need to do, but what do those people, those people need to change, those people need to change, I don't really need to change in a family church. They, they want to revitalize, not just renew, but really revitalize, capture a real sense of joy in their congregation. They, they want to perpetuate, however, their identity, their, their, their life, but they, but they don't have a purpose in life. Family churches have come to the realization that as much as they love one another, they don't really know what the church is about. Um, the enormous popularity of Rick Warren's purpose-driven church was driven by these congregations. Family churches bought Rick Warren's book by the hundreds, and they did the faith formation process, and they explored all that because they didn't know what the purpose of the church and the purpose of their church really was. They need to find that purpose. And they have children. Usually their preoccupation is youth groups. Uh, family churches kind of live in the illusion that the youth are the future of their church. If only we had a youth group, we'd be okay. If only we had a young pastor with a charismatic personality who would magnetically draw in the teenagers, we would be okay. If only we could have a, a salaried staff position, and often they work because they can't afford it, in ecumenical cooperation in the community, and they'll have a, a, a shared or ecumenical youth minister. And, and these churches often, because they don't want to really transform themselves, they tend to go through youth ministers and youth programs every 18 months. They'll, they'll try it, it'll work, it'll be uncomfortable, it will demand change they don't want to do, then they fire the youth minister and they try again and you kind of get this cycle going. Um, their leadership, they, they really want uh, not a preacher but a storyteller. Uh, they want someone who can be very engaging, interactive, conversational, storytelling. They want a, a pastor who is, who is youthful. They do want a pastor who is a good one-to-one -one counselor and will spend a lot of one-to-one -one time. They want the pastor to be their good friend, their best friend, someone that they can greet and talk to in the grocery store, that they can, they can show off you know, to the in-laws when they visit. They, they want that pastor to be ordained and certified because they too are loyal to the denomination, and they are loyal to the denominational mission. In fact, in the family church, uh, much or all of their mission budget is given to the denominational mission projects. They don't often have a lot of local or separate congregational projects, but they will invest it and give it away to the denomination. And they still have a high trust in denominational leadership. Chaplaincy churches, family churches, tend to be the churches which are, are most loyal to the, to the convention, to the presbytery, to the conference, to the diocese, to the judicatory. Uh, and they tend also then to be the most disturbed by all of the media stories that undermine the credibility of the clergy. Anybody that's on AOL, you've noticed there was yet another one on AOL today. And, and, and the media loves to undermine the confidence of the family church, which is one of the most popular common churches around, in the credibility of their ordained leadership because they, they, they are so loyal to the denominational mission. Now, they too tend to miss the middle. They tend, when you go to the family church, the, 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 the group that seems to be missing demographically are people between the age of 18 and 40 or 45. See, in the chaplaincy church, they're missing everyone from 10 or 12 years old to the age of about 55. But in the family church, they're missing anyone between 18 and about 45. They're gone for some reason. They don't know how to reach them. If you want to transform them, kind of get all that up there, their clergy have life, 
but they are often extremely unfocused. They are running off in a hundred different directions at the same time. Often when I talk to family church pastors, and I've had conversations even here with people who are of that kind of congregation, they'll use the metaphor like, I'm keeping so many plates spinning in the air, you know, that I, I just don't even have time to think. And I'm visiting here, I'm doing this, I'm visiting here, I'm doing that. And, and they're not very focused on the single missional purpose of their church or their personal mission in life. So if you can take them on retreat, if you can give them a mentoring relationship with a group of pastors at the next level uh, of congregational life, one of the things they will do is help them focus and align all of their time and energy with a single purposeful mission in their life and they will no longer be sidetracked. Uh, they often in a family church talk about overcoming obstacles. These, these are churches that are realizing that they need to have a better stewardship plan, they need to tear out this wall, they need to you know, fix the floor plan of the sanctuary, they need to add a, a handicapped elevator, they need to put a ramp up the steps, uh, they need to repaint, they need to take the asbestos out of the building. There, there's a lot of you know, just kind of strategic, practical, financial, property kinds of obstacles in their mind that they want to try to address. And, and yes, if you want to you know, break these churches out of the box, you need to break control. And, and the control here is not so much denial and infl inflexibility. Um, they, they've kind of become more aware of their postal code. They, they know more about the demographic diversity. Uh, they, are, they are more flexible. They're willing to consider some new alternatives of ministry, but they will exercise control in turf protection, dithering, and denigration. Uh, turf protection means in the family church that they'll say, you can't change the nursery. That's my turf. My family's looked after the nursery all generations. That's our decision. You can't meddle in it. Uh, the choir. You can't tell the choir to sing different songs because I'm the choir director and I volunteered here for all this time and, and I have to make those. That's, that's my turf. I protect that. Ushers. I've been an usher here for 350 years and so have my friends. You can't remove me. That's my job. That's what I do. You know, that's my turf. Uh, and the only way to break that turf protection is to build the clarity of core values, beliefs, vision, and mission. Some of you have heard me say this so often. These are churches that live in a fog about their DNA. And as you know, when you live in a fog, what you hear are foghorns. And so when a church lives in a fog about its clear core values, beliefs, vision, and mission, you allow foghorns, controllers, intimidating, powerful personalities to honk and control the missional shipping and the innovation in the life of the church. And, and they will shape it around their particular preferences and tastes. Uh, the only way you break people out of all of that, is, of turf protection, is that clarity and consensus around the DNA, core values, beliefs, vision, and mission. And that can sometimes take uh, months and even years to develop. Uh, dithering. The, these are churches that love the ad hoc committee. That is their knee-jerk reaction to everything. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Let's get an ad hoc committee and we'll investigate it. And they kind of dither and they kind of dither and they kind of dither. And if I make a strategic suggestion to them as a consultant, what they'll do is they'll say, gee, that's very interesting, Tom. Give us a list of 25 churches exactly like us within an hour's driving distance that have already done it, proven it, and can show us. And, and they'll visit every, different, every one of them, kind of waiting and waiting and waiting until they're 100% certain that it'll work. They don't want to take a risk. And denigration. This is one of the hardest issues uh, that, that you'll face as a pastor or a change agent in the church be, because when you push too far and you press people on their core values and beliefs and you begin to innovate too far uh, to kind of break them out to the next step, the family church will suddenly turn nasty. And, and you will find death threats thrust under the door of the pastor's office. And the telephone campaigns will begin. And your spouse will be slandered in public. And your children will be threatened 
on playgrounds because you're breaking the harmony. You're breaking the family spirit. You're, you're challenging certain controllers. And, and although, although it's very painful to hear this, there is this Jekyll and Hyde kind of mentality to the family church. On the one hand, it's, it's loving and it's welcoming and they're friendly and they'll serve you coffee and they'll get you to be in their committees. And then on the other hand, if you step too far away, they can turn very, very nasty. And so some of these family churches, as they try to break out of the box, their annual meetings become extraordinary conflictual. Generally speaking, if you just look at the bottom of the column, and then I'm going to stop and just kind of see what questions we have. There are four basic uh, things that, that chaplaincy and family church leaders need to learn. And if they can learn these things, they can break out of the box, and they can begin to be creative and innovative and relevant in whole new ways, and they can go to the next level of what it means to be in God's mission, if they can learn these things. It may take a while, but you can do it. First thing they need to learn is that they need to learn how to carry on a spirit-filled conversation with culture. What I mean is they need to be able to go deep, deep into prayer and farther out to listen and observe the public they need to learn how to read and understand demographic trends. They need to discern the three or four major lifestyle segments in their mission field. They need to understand who is out there and where it's going, and they need to do it prayerfully. Now, in the United States, there's a company called Percept, uh, which is nationwide and which will provide churches this kind of information. But in Canada, it is much harder to get that information. However, it is true that in any given mission field, there are about three or four primary lifestyle segments out of about 45 to 50 that are possible. And you can know what the spiritual, physical, relational, emotional needs are that are priorities for those lifestyle segments. And that will guide you as you begin to build worship and target preaching and multiply small groups and so on to become more and more relevant to the needs of the community around you. You need to have a spirit-filled conversation with culture. Here's a tactic. And I invite you to think about this tactic. And, and if, you're a part of, if you're in a family church, and I suspect many of you are in family or chaplaincy churches, that's kind of why I've been dwelling a lot on it, try this when you go home. Uh, try to develop as many listening prayer triads as possible. Uh, the rule of thumb is you want to have one listening prayer triad for every ten people in worship. Doesn't sound too hard? This is what a listening prayer triad. Let's say you're the triad, okay, right in the front row. You covenant as a triad for the next eight to ten weeks. Every Tuesday night, say, you will rendezvous after work at Craig's house where he will feed you great coffee and dessert. And you will read a chunk of Luke Acts and you will pray for guidance. Then the three of you will go to any public place within your mission field. Remember what I said a mission field was? A mission field is designed by the average distance people in your community drive to work and shop. So you figure out what that is and then you try it. You go to any public place in that mission field where people gather. It could be a, 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 a shopping mall, a food court, a restaurant, a Walmart, uh, uh, a Starbucks, a Tim Hortons, wherever people gather. And as a triad, for the next hour on Tuesday night, you exercise the one spiritual gift God gives every human being, and that's the spiritual gift of lurking. <laughs> and you're not supposed to say anything or do anything. You just lurk. If you need to take notes, do it surreptitiously so nobody gets mad at you for eavesdropping. I'm not talking about invading anyone's privacy. Do not bug the booth at McDonald's next to you or anything. But just keep your ears open and keep your eyes open and watch what the heck is going on. And then after an hour or so, you go back to Craig's house on Tuesday night and you debrief 
What did you see? What are people talking about? How did they behave, positively or negatively? And then you finish the evening praying aloud, and it must be aloud for complete strangers. And your triad does that every Tuesday night for the next eight or ten weeks, and your triad does it, and your triad does it, and your triad does it. And you feed what you're learning into the pastor and to the worship team, and it's reflected in the chancel drama or into the preaching or into the singing of the worship service. And every time I've been with a church that ever does that and really pushes that triad for about eight to ten weeks, somebody begins to cry. Somebody bursts into tears. Because their heart is opened to the mission. And you begin to break out. You begin to have that spirit-filled conversation with culture. Uh, now, I, I warn you, family churches and chaplaincy churches resist listening prayer triads like crazy. It scares people to death. That they, you just want me to stand there and listen and observe and, and I might learn something about God? I might burst into tears? I might, you know, they don't really want to do it. They'd rather read a book about it. See, but they don't want to do it. And you push them. You, pu you do it. And you begin to learn how to carry on a spirit-filled conversation with culture. That's the first thing you do. Second thing you have to do is, is you have to train and equip these people in motivational faith sharing. They have to learn how to spontaneously, naturally, non-judgmentally, freely, openly, and joyously share their faith whenever they have an opportunity. Most people in the Family Chaplaincy Church, that's the job of the pastor. We pay staff to do that. And they need to learn all about how to use lifestyle moments to seize opportunities in normal everyday life to be able to engage complete strangers, friends, neighbors, work associates, or even their teenagers in conversations about God and about faith. Now, the best way to do that is modeling, not reading a book or a curriculum. And so you'll, you'll take people away on retreat and you'll, have, you'll, you'll, you'll do some, you know, some uh, uh, dramas or you'll do some modeling to show people how it's done and let people laugh and talk it through and get over their self-consciousness and so on. But they need to be able to articulate not just doctrine, but what are the core values and the bedrock beliefs in their heart to which they turn to for strength when they're in trouble. They need to be able to share that and articulate that and give it away if they're going to get out of the box. Third thing you'll need to do is uh, teach people small group adult spiritual growth disciplines. And again, there are many, many different curricula and resources out there for small group development. Uh, choose one, customize one, but you'll need to find a lay person or a staff person. You'll need to find a leader who will take that as their primary mission goal and they'll learn how to find, train, deploy, evaluate and hold accountable small group leaders and you multiply as many intentional small group adult faith formation groups as possible and the family church begins to break out of the box. And the fourth thing you need to do is increase your budget for the continuing education of laity. Uh, most chaplaincy and family churches barely have a budget for the continuation of, of clergy and nothing for the continuing education of laity. Uh, you need to invest in the training and the equipping of volunteers. You need to begin to train ushers and train choir members and train uh, 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 administration teams and trustees. You know, train them in what? Mission, teamwork, integrity, skills. Train the ushers to be sensitive to new microcultures that come to church. You need to invest a lot more in training for these people. And that will begin to change your role as the pastor from the one who does the ministry to the one who equips the ministry and the congregation begins to cross over beyond the box, out of the box. Now I want to take a moment and see what questions you have before we talk about 
what I call culturally normative churches. But how can I help this focus for you? How can how can you know how can we carry this coaching another step for you? <laughs> Ease them out of control, or or vote, and, or, or or maybe wait until they die, perhaps. And <laughs> that's a way of letting. Well, uh, that's a good that's a good question. Um, and let me offer two things. Um, uh, first thing I would offer uh, is uh, it is important for you to kind of learn and, and think and also to help your board and your key leaders to think um, that, that the opposite of mercy in, in church growth language, the opposite of mercy is missional urgency. There's the difference. In other words, the more missionally urgent you become, the more passionate, the more, the more focused, the more, the more desperate, the more excited, the more, the more you target mission, the more you become urgent and, and, and more, more intentional and move people along and you become less merciful. And so you need to kind of think, well, well what's my mission? See, the more mission-focused you become, the more you uncover your own sense of personal mission and personal calling, and the more that fills your whole life and being and everything else, the, the more you're focused on the stranger and on the mission then the less apt you are to just put up and wait, 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 and the more ready you'll be to say, look, let's, let's cut the trivia, let's move on. Let's, let's keep focus to the mission. So the second comment uh, I make is, is, is this is really all about controlling alignment, not tactics. So, so the problem is you have, you have people controlling tactics but who don't have a clue about core values, beliefs, vision, or mission. They're just controlling tactics. I like it this way rather than this way. I don't really know why. It's not because of a mission. It's not because I'm trying to reach anybody. It's just how I like it. That's what you're breaking control. And you break control because you take control of the mission alignment. You don't tell people what to do. You just keep them focused to the mission. And the mission is out there, not in here. So if, in a sense, yeah, most people when they break control, most pastors in a family church always go through a period in which they are accused of being dictators. Always. You'll hear that all the time. Oh, they're dictating. No, no. They're just urgent. They're just focused. They're just trying to tell you that's the mission. The tactics are not the mission. That's the mission. And so they're more urgent about it. And, and, and that, that often comes across as dictatorial, but you're not telling people what to do or what not. You're just saying, no, we want to get to the mission. This other stuff is a sidetrack. You have to be ahead of people. You can get too far ahead, and then you have to kind of come back and bring them along and so on. But most clergy err on the side of caution. And they should err on the side of boldness. And the reason they err on the side of caution is that, well, again, I, I, I know it's general, but most clergy since the post-war period of 1945 have been nurtured and raised and trained with the spiritual gift of mercy. Most clergy today, the dominant spiritual gift in their heart is usually the gift of mercy. That's not how it was before the wars or even in the 19th century. You know those pictures of our elders and our clergy that are often the, you know, the church, and they all are standing there with these stern faces. These are not merciful people. You look at them. <laughs> well, this was also the era of the great Sunday school and the great global missions and, and all that. Well, these were missionally targeted people. But after the war, we became soft of heart and we were compassionate and a lot of things, but and for those reasons, but we're kind of very merciful. Well, this is a hard thing. I, I personally, as a pastor, I, I you know, my, uh, as a, I've been ordained some 30-odd years or more, and I would say it took about 10 years for the Holy Spirit to beat the spiritual gift of mercy out of me. <laughs> and, and it was hard, you know, because, man, I felt guilty. You know, I'm, you know, first time I put somebody into tears, I felt real bad. But darn it, 
She needed to be in tears. She needed to repent from controlling God's mission just to suit her taste for organ music. You know? So, yeah, yeah, now go home and do it. I mean, you know, it, but, but, you know, that, that's, the, it, it, that's the personal transformation part within the heart of the clergy. Now, I know when you do that, you know, your board gets mad at you, your, you know, you, other people get mad at you, and so on. And, and if, as that escalates, that's where we get into what I call the, the, the fifth level of control. That's denigration. And, and, and it can get very serious. And, you know, I've only been physically assaulted twice. <laughs> Both times it was an organist. And both times were in Canada. So, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. It's certainly true that um, in a culture of fear across North America, there has been a strong tendency for churches to be far less innovative and creative than they were in the 1990s. And a lot of people are, are basically, if I can use the words, circling the wagons, bringing people home, hunkering down in the living room and the kitchen, remodeling and getting new plumbing, but they're not doing anything, you know, very adventurous. And, and there is certainly that sense. Let's get everybody inside. We'll be all warm and fuzzy and we'll love each other and take care of each other and so on. But, but we, you know, just in my talking, you begin to see how inward, how, how, how isolationist, how, you know, that does not advance God's mission very far. And, and so you need to bear down, be more merciless, and by that I mean more missionally urgent, to, to draw people beyond themselves and begin to look outward. Now, some of that is really all about breaking control. And some of the, and, and, and this is, I, I, I mean, and some of the worst controllers in the family church are really nice people. We often, when I use the word controller, people often imagine, you know, mean old, you know, 150-year-old crones or something. You know, or just, you know, but not, no, they often are nice people and they're often your best friends. And so it makes it even more hard to be missionally urgent and, and to break control. But there's a, a tremendous sense uh, of, of, of this urgency to break control. Most people confirm that the worst controllers today uh, in a family church, the worst controllers are not seniors but they are first wave baby boomers between the ages of 46 and 62. Unfortunately, they're on your board. You know, many of them. But many of them, I mean, the baby boomer generation, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're the most selfish generation in the world. And they didn't, they didn't come by that dubious title, you know, for, for the wrong reason. So it's hard to break them out and, and you need to break that control. Uh, one last comment, Craig, and we'll see another hand was flying. But, but I, back in the 80s, uh, the big thing in church consultation was conflict resolution. And, and then, you know, the, John Savage was into that, and then, and then all the seminaries and colleges got into that, and, and the CPE people got into that, and most clergy were trained by the time they got out of seminary in conflict resolution, and look where it got us. There's another trend beginning, and it's called control intervention. And control intervention is now the emerging wave of, of, of church leadership to break people out of control and on to, into mission. And, and that's, that's the kind of thing I could talk more about tomorrow afternoon, and, and there's a lot of training and coaching that can be done on it. Well, uh, I don't know about this convention or whatever. I do know, talking with many, many denominations, most denominations I work with and middle judicatories I work with, uh, they are heavily immersed in conflict resolution. Um, and, and a lot of it is, is around trying to save and rescue pastoral relationships uh, and, and you know, resolve differences between clergy and laity and stuff like that. But control intervention is probably the, when you see a breakthrough church growth leader who's grown a small church into a big church, and, and maybe I better say a small mission into a big mission, you'll often find someone who, who scores very low on, on mercy. They're, they're not real merciful people. 
doesn't mean they're unfaithful. They're faithful people. They're mission-driven people. But, but they don't have a lot of patience to hold your hand for very long. Yeah, there is a continuity. And, and uh, when you lead a church through a very intentional process of identity discernment, uh, DNA discernment, vision discernment, whatever you call it, a process of building clarity and consensus around core values, beliefs, vision, and mission, and take people deep in that, you will see as people go deep into the hearts and begin to kind of lay out what really, really does matter and what they really value and what they really believe, sure enough, there's continuities with historic uh, faith positions of the Baptist church and, and you know, values that they've had in the past. But I mean, there is continuity. But you also begin to challenge some other things that, that really are not as faithful or sidetracks or whatever. And the problem is for so many in-the-box churches, they just don't know what their purpose, what their identity, what their core values, they just don't know. And because they don't know, they allow controlling, intimidating, uh, powerful personality, needy people, whatever, to, to, to manipulate them to their agendas. Now, sometimes those are clergy. But I, I don't want to just lay the blame on laity. I mean, clergy can be just as bad at imposing on a foggy congregation a personal DNA. And I know with, with integrity, you don't want to be that. You don't want to just be someone that lays it on people and says, yeah, and I understand that. But in order, in, in order to break everybody out, including yourself, you have to focus the vision, the mission. You have to blow away the fog. And you will have to pursue that and push that and drive that. And it will make you look like a dictator. But you're just being an assertive leader. That's right. Oh, all right. Amen. All right. Okay. Well, I hope to say more about that if we have time this evening. I'd like to get there. Because uh, on the other side of the paper you're holding, I, I talk a bit about the leadership transformations you go through. But to try to give an immediate response and a quick response to you, uh, what, what I, I guess uh, what you see for transformational leadership are spiritual gifts around leadership specifically, around visioning, around mentoring. Uh, transformational leaders are very strong trainers, equippers. Uh, they have learned certain important skills like demographic you know, understanding and, and small group development and lay leadership empowerment and those kinds of things. Uh, so transformational leaders uh, are very, uh, 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 they think long term. Uh, they think in terms of building teams. They invest enormous time mentoring rather than visiting. Uh, and they, they really kind of do the Jesus model. In order to transform the church, they spend a huge amount of time with a handful of key leaders. Growing them up, mentoring them, and then those key leaders mentor other leaders and so on. So, so they tend to operate, transformational leaders operate uh, not one to one, but one to three. 1 to 5, 1 to 10, you know, 1 to small group in that sense of the word. Um, because some of you are here. So, some of you in the room have paid the price. You've moved beyond the chaplaincy church. And you are maybe in, but you are crossing the boundary out of the family church. And you're going from in the box to out of the box. So let me talk a little bit about out of the box churches or what we sometimes call culturally normative churches. These are churches that are not resistant to change. These are churches that are really pretty comfortable with change. Uh, they're pretty balanced in terms of accountability and productivity. They, they are less patient with, with wasting a lot of time getting permissions and approvals. They're raring to go and they want to be more productive. And they are less interested in theology and more interested in Christology. So when you go out of the box, you really don't worry so much about being systematically and doctrinally pure, but you do want to be very close to Jesus. I mean, you are very clear about your Christological experiences. Now, once you go out of the box, the first kind of out of the box church, the most common type, and you have maybe, you know, 20 to 50 of them in your convention, and some of you are leaders of these kinds of churches that are moving out of the box and becoming what I would call more of the program church. You're no longer talking about uh, a family church. That's not your major metaphor.
but you're talking about faith community. You're using metaphors of, of organism, for example, and so on. And as you go out of the box, these are churches that are what Lyle Schaller described, 24-7 churches. There, there, are, there are programs happening all the time. There, the parking lot is always full. Something's always going on in the building. There's stuff going on Sunday. There's stuff going on midweek, in the daytime, at nighttime, because the church is starting to offer multiple choices. There's a program for this and a program for this. We got a food bank over here, and we got an outreach center over here, and we got a clothing depot, and we got a midweek children's program, and we got an elder group, and we got a women's group, and we got small groups, and we got, you know, all these things are beginning to bubble and happen in this out of the box church. The, the imagination, the innovation, the creative energies are beginning to turn loose. Why? Well, because we're clearer now about our core values, beliefs, vision, and mission. We know what our mission is. We're headed for our mission, and we can begin to trust people to do some creative and innovative kinds of things. And so what we see in the out-of-the-box church is that they become very, very philanthropic. There's all kinds of great social services. There's all kinds of great outreach kinds of ministries. They think in terms of task groups and projects. So they're always recruiting people. They're always looking for volunteers. They got a task group going to do hurricane relief in New Orleans. And they got a task group to go over to the Indian Reservation. And because we're in a more affluent area, we've got a task group that's going to fly to India and do this or that. And it, but they're very short term kind of task groups. And one of the things you'll notice about these kinds of churches is that they don't have a long memory and they don't have a lot of interest in chronic uh, mission. It's always acute intervention mission. So these, these churches are notorious for pumping a lot of money and sending a lot of volunteers for hurricane relief in New Orleans, and then six months later, they're gone. And the New Orleans people are saying, where did they go? We still need help. But see, their attention is now somewhere else. You know, because they're just hopping from crisis to crisis to crisis. So they're kind of crisis-driven, you know, short-term project, task groups. These are the churches that are most worried about ideological public policy. And usually when, when, when denominations debate issues like sexual orientation or, or whatever, it usually is a quarrel between family churches and program churches. Everybody else is on the sideline. Chaplaincy churches don't care as long as you keep subsidizing our budget. You know, you can do whatever you want. And, and, and the other different churches we'll talk about, they don't care because, to be honest, they don't care what the denominational public policy is anyway. They're more interested in their own practice. So these churches are, program churches are very much into advocacy programs, petitioning the government to do this and that. Uh, they're very much involved in shaping public policy, uh, you know, both locally and, and uh, uh, provincially and so on. Uh, they're very permission-giving. They still have the bureaucracy. They, they still have a top-down control, but they're benevolent about it. See, it's a, it's a benevolent hierarchy. But there still is a fist in the glove, so if you, if you do something really stupid or immoral, they'll come down on you like a ton of bricks. But they are permission-giving, and they will multiply worship by style. And now we'll have two, maybe three different worship services and, and, and now it truly will be style and we'll have a traditional worship service with the gowns and the hymnology and the choir and the, and the big organ music. And, and this is not just going to be any old organ music. It's going to be great organ music because these are, in a, these are quest for quality churches. They're performance driven churches. They've got, they just don't have preaching. They've got great preaching. They've got great organ music. If they've got a band and a contemporary music sound, they've got great bongos, and they've got great electric guitars, and they've got great images. They've now, you know, see the family church added the sound system. The program church has put video, LCD projection, and imaging in. Okay. They're burning incense. Dry ice is floating across the stage. Okay, so, so you know you're in a different worship service. This is not the 9.30 service, you say. I came at the wrong time. Set the clock. 
Now, now these churches really do, they're, they're, they're wanting to reach out. When they engage a consultant or they go to a denomination, they're saying, help us reach out, help us reach another microculture, uh, help us grow members, we, we want to get more and more people in the church, and they're going to renovate like crazy, tear down, replace, and so on. And, and if the chaplaincy church focused on children and the family church focused on youth, the program church has awakened to the fact that the youth aren't the future of the church, transformed, spiritually disciplined adults between the ages of 25 and 45 are. And they're investing a lot of energy in the 20-somethings and the 30-somethings. They're really pushing this small group thing. They're really serious about adult faith formation. The, the membership assimilation class, the, 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 the study classes are really beginning to multiply and grow. And they're looking, the lead, if you look for the leaders in these churches, the leaders in these churches are often career clergy who have survived. They are, they are clergy who have managed to survive the chaplaincy and family church. They often have uh, 10, 15, 20 years of service. They are very friendly people, but they are very good administrators. They function much like CEOs of a major nonprofit organization because they've got all these different programs and projects that they're trying to handle. Uh, they are very strong preachers, and they are pretty good bridge builders and harmonizers, mainly because there are different microcultures, races, groups, income bodies. You know, the, the, the congregation is much more mirror image of the demographic diversity of the community, and they're very good at building bridges between racial, cultural, language, economic diversity within, within the church and within that community. That's the kind of leader this is. Uh, they, the, the biggest thing I want to point out before going on to the next slide is that they, these leaders uh, are often the, the people that will advance to middle judicatory leadership. Uh, when the middle judicatory is looking for the next president of a conference or a next staff person of a conference, they will tend to raid or they will tend to take away this kind of pastor. And these pastors remain quite loyal to the church. Now, the key strategic moves, if you want to keep this church going, are these. Uh, you do need to help them build ever clearer consensus around values, beliefs, vision, and mission. They desperately need your help to streamline their organizational model. Those of you who are with me in the, in the mini-seminar at 3.30 this afternoon, see, this is where you start talking about organizational change. Not in the family church or the chaplaincy church. That would just throw everybody off. But now you have to do it because your bureaucracy is unwieldy. And, of course, because you've got a 7 day, 7, 7 20, 24-7 ministry going on, these people are really getting serious about tithing, about stewardship. Uh, they don't just have one annual stewardship campaign. They have two. They have one in November aimed at people over 45 who look toward tax receipts. And they have a second one in May after tax time aimed at people under 45 who are looking to spend their tax refund. And they're very different strategies aimed at very different people, and they're very serious about raising money. Now, they too have got to break control because there, there are other stages of control. You'll find in the program church what, what traps them, what holds them back, will be hostage taking and king making. Hostage taking is kind of the last gasp of controllers who say, if you keep this innovation up, I'm going to take the choir and we're going to leave and join the Presbyterians. See, that's hostage take. And then kingmaking is when most of the controllers are gone and someone sidles up to you and say, I'm behind you if I can be your best friend. See, I'll be the, the chamberlain that guards that. And this is always the problem because if you don't break that control, the denomination takes the pastor into the judicatory and then in the vacancy, the chamberlain becomes the king and now you're back into the issues of control. When that happens, the program church almost always retreats to become a family church. I'll speed up. Are you able to give me five minutes? If you can. I, I will, I'll try to kind of finish uh, at least this part of the picture 
And then we can talk more again tomorrow night. Because this, this, this line down the center of the page, uh, it, it represents the Great Divide. Uh, this this, this is, is the biggest revolutionary shift in church growth. And the reason for that is everything in the first three columns, chaplaincy, family, and program, everything in those three columns has been about a top-down church. And when you cross the divide, you become a bottom-up church. And there is nothing in the world more stressful than crossing the chasm between being a top-down to a bottom-up church. See, a top-down church in the chaplaincy family and program church, the top-down church is all about reacting, recruiting, mandating, and supervising. Top-down. Send the board away on retreat. They come back with a strategic plan. Recruit people to implement it. You know, they'll do it. You evaluate the results. It's all top-down. But when you cross the divide into the next kind of church, the discipling church, it's bottom-up. And bottom-up means that you stoke the fire of adult spiritual growth and teams have real power to discern design, implement, and evaluate mission without having to ask the board for permission. See, this isn't just a permission-giving church now. This is a church in which permission-giving and permission-withholding are irrelevant. And now the board has stepped way away from management, and people are radically free to discern, design, implement, and evaluate mission. So, you will find these discipling churches become the maverick churches of your denomination. They no longer attend the denominational meetings. They no longer attend to denominational public policy. They don't leave the denomination. They just kind of step away. They're, they're eager for change. They are very productive, streamlined accountability, and very Christological, they are out of the box. They are all about transforming lives, not doing projects. See, they're not managing programs, they're growing leaders. These are multiplying teams, not task groups. They are ruthlessly, rigorously embedding the DNA as a vehicle of accountability. They are empowering leaders, they are targeting missions. They are not a staff leadership church but a volunteer empowerment church. And the staff configuration, the organizational model, completely change in this kind of a congregation. So to just quickly finish the loop, what they really want to do is to go deep and deep and deep into Christ and further and further and further into mission. They're not just going to renovate, they're going to relocate. They don't want just members, they want to create disciples. That's how aggressive they are. Uh, their leader, their pastor, is almost always a maverick to the denomination. You know, the other clergy in their, in their area are whispering behind their back and saying, he's weird. She's odd. I'm not sure they're really Baptist. They are, they are radical innovators. They are investing all their time equipping. They don't do any visiting. They don't do any teaching. They don't do any attending of meetings. They, they, because they're too busy equipping and training volunteers to do them. They are extremely sensitive to cultural changes and they are very evangelical in the sense that they are very assertive, excited about sharing the transformational experience of Christ. Evangelical. And if you want to kind of continue to move them along, well, this is what you're doing for them. You help them train, 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 train. Everything is being trained constantly. Uh, they are both receiving and discerning gifts they are busy looking for visions, they are maximizing trust, and they help every person every, who is in leadership in the church answer the key question, and the key question is, what is it about my experience with Jesus this community cannot live without? So in my, in my church, for example, when we're at this point, and by the way, by the time I got there, I was pretty bruised and battered. I've had, I had the death threats thrust under the office door, I had the slanderous comments around. I'd been ostracized by many people in the denomination. But we were growing the church and having huge impact on the community. But at that point, I never had an usher, choir member, board member, or trustee who was not personally mentored and coached to answer the question, what is it about my experience with Jesus this community cannot live without? 
my experience, in my gut, in my heart, with Christ, the transforming agent that is so crucial and important that unless I share it, somebody's life will be impoverished. Every usher needed to be able to answer that question instantly and immediately without being asked. And now that begins to multiply disciples. Now, even having said that, uh, I, I will stop, I promise, Craig. Even after going this far, we, we are still not done in, 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 in sharing the diversity of church growth in North America. I mean, I think some of you, for some of you in the room, I've gone far enough that it's exciting, and for some of you, it's almost beyond comprehension. But there's more. And that's the amazing, God is doing even more. And we haven't even gone beyond the box yet. We've just gotten out of the box. Now, beyond the box, we're seeing the multiplication of house churches and micro churches led by non professionals, non certified, non ordained. We are seeing the multiplication of small groups, church planting, multi site. We are seeing global missions. We are seeing incredible things as God expands the mission field. But for many churches, that's way beyond our comprehension, or at least way beyond what we can do immediately. In, a, in North America, 80% are in the box, 15% are out of the box, and only about 5% are beyond the box. In the rest of the world, it's not that way. In the rest of the world, most are out of the box or beyond the box. But in North America, we lag very far behind. But God's doing great things in growing the church. And, and tomorrow, if you still uh, have the patience to be with me, tomorrow evening I'd like to, to focus especially on leadership, uh, the transformation of leaders, the spiritual discipline of leaders. Uh, and this kind of speaks to the heart of you who are clergy and lay leaders here in the room, uh, just what it means for you uh, to, to follow Christ on the road to mission and, and the kinds of uh, stresses but also the kinds of joys that lie ahead of you. Thank you.